Our next speaker this uh, morning, uh, to kick off the morning anyway, is uh, John Rose. Uh, John is here uh, uh, with his wife, Michelle, who is the daughter of uh, Dave and Peggy Watson. He's a 2007 graduate of Memphis School of Preaching, but we don't hold that against him. Uh, he has uh, spoken on uh, lectureships in Arkansas, California, Texas, Tennessee, and Florida. He's currently preaching for uh, the Central Church of Christ in Naples, Florida, where he began working this past uh, July 10. It's certainly uh, Brendan and I's privilege to have John in our house last year and certainly enjoyed his uh, company. Uh, John will be speaking to us this morning, uh, uh, reviewing the book together again by Rick Ackley and uh, Bob Russell from the Christian Church. Uh, John, come and speak to us. I'd like to begin by expressing my thanks to this congregation, to the fine eldership, Brother Cohn, Brother, Brother Roth, Brother Stephen, for putting together and uh, this lectureship, and Brother Brown, his great directorship, the opportunity that is ours as speakers in this lectureship to defend the gospel of Christ. And so do we ask, is this a good day? Yes, it is, because we have an opportunity to earnestly contend for the faith. Appreciate very much also the congregation at Naples, at the Central Church of Christ, and their support of us. We couldn't be here uh, necessarily without them. We're thankful to all the good brethren there and their fight for the faith. This book by Rick Ashley and Bob Russell. Rick Ashley is a member of the church, so he claims. I, wonder that by the things that he has written. Bob Russell is a Christian church preacher and they collaborated in this book to write together again, Restoring Unity in Christ After a Century of Separation. Well, like so many of the books that we have reviewed thus far, these fellows go back and try to bring forward the case for their position by going back to the restoration movement and that is much the thrust of this book and so i appreciate brother vaughn's lectureship earlier this week and giving some background concerning thomas campbell because they cite him and barton stone to establish their case and the fact of the matter is they have no case and we're going to notice that this morning the real thrust of this book is all about fellowship because, as the title says, together again, they want to restore unity in Christ after a century of separation, so they say. And so to understand this book, to see the error in it, you really need to understand fellowship. And that is a subject that is wanting, certainly within the religious world and even in the church today. Many do not understand the confines of biblical fellowship. I begin by noticing something from Lynn Anderson, and as a side point, if you look through the several pages of endorsements at the beginning of this book, you'll find many of the men that we are reviewing in this lectureship have written accolades of this book. And so the reputation of the other authors in this lectureship uh, are also a weighty reputation against this book as well. Lynn Anderson wrote the following, page 19 of this book, if I am dreaming, don't wake me now. I've waited 50 years for this with their new book. Together again, Bob Russell and Rick Ashley are moving our hope of Christian unity to a whole new level of nationwide visibility and grassroots ownership. I thought Christ owned the church. Churches of Christ and independent Christian churches have been divided for far too long over far too little. Well, that is the entire premise of this book. Now, if we turn to page 40 of this book, we find in that, from that page, we find what these authors say is the real thrust of this book, what they're really trying to say, what they use as the foundation for their doctrine. Now, they say they're quoting and mentioning Thomas Campbell here, again, this is from page 40, it says, let, let us return to Thomas Campbell's simple designation 
and call all those who, quote, love the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity our brothers. We will argue just as passionately for our beliefs, and we will seek to unite the churches on the truths of God's word. But if a group claims to be in submission to the Lord Jesus and sincerely seeks to follow his word, then let's call them brothers and sisters. Let's do so in the hope and trust that God's grace is sufficient not only to cover a multitude of sins, but a multitude of doctrinal errors as well. In other words, let's extend to them the same grace we know we need. Well, there is much in that passage that uh, they wrote as to their beliefs and the irrationality of their doctrine. In this passage, we find unity and diversity, unity at all costs. Sincerity trumps the word of God. And these are indeed the foundations on which this book is built. And this is nothing short of the sifting and shifting sands that brought destruction to the builder described in Matthew 7. You do notice at the end of verse 27 that great was the fall of the house that was built upon the sand. And so shall be the fall of these men. When we do not build upon the word of God, great will be our fall. And together again is not built upon God's word. Therefore, great will be its fall. This book is but a perversion of the biblical doctrine of fellowship. Now, if you look at the lectureship book, you'll find a rather lengthy uh, portion of the chapter that deals with biblical fellowship. And the reason why I included that is those who would read this book and examine it and look at the lectureship a book would need to understand some things about fellowship in order to rightly see what's going on in this book. That uh, in as much as we haven't much time this morning, I'm going to skip over that. And I will give you a little bit of information, however, that comes from that. And particularly coming from 1 John chapter 1. Now, in understanding fellowship, we need to understand some things. Verse 5 of that chapter tells us God is light and in him is no darkness at all. What do we learn from really the entire chapter of 1 John? This first chapter. God is light and he is the standard of fellowship. Only by faithfully walking according to his word can one be in fellowship with God. All those who do not faithfully walk according to his word do not have fellowship with God. How long will it take before these men realize that? even those in the church. And the righteous have fellowship with God and with each other because, notice this, because God is righteousness. Now, the other side of the coin is the fact that the unrighteous have fellowship with the unrighteous and Satan and not with God or his righteous servants because, notice this, because God is not unrighteousness. And that, brethren and friends, is biblical fellowship. We need to know that. We need to understand that. And indeed, it is very sad that many religious people, even those in the Church of Christ, do not have the first inkling about how to determine biblical fellowship. Now, however, the well-studied person will not make that type of mistake, and that's the purpose of these lectures. We want to examine now Ashley and Russell's standard. Well, the fact of the matter, there are many people in the world who speak of, quote, unquote, the circles of fellowship. And the fact is, only, the only biblical circle of fellowship that exists is the circle of fellowship that God has drawn. And the parameters of that circle have already been drawn and have been established by God's word. In short, it's God's way or no way at all. We must understand that. We need to understand that there is but one standard or rule concerning fellowship. Galatians 6.16, Philippians 3.16, there is but one rule, and that rule is the word of God. Now, it is altogether impossible for any man to engage in biblical fellowship if he does not heed that one rule. If a man sets up anything or anyone above God, now notice this, he becomes an idolater. I wonder how many of these people realize that, that they are becoming idolaters. Why? 
If we notice Colossians 3 and verse 5, the last part of the verse says, and covetousness, which is idolatry. We might ask the question, how could covetousness be idolatry? Well, the fact of the matter is that when a man lusts after that which God has forbidden, and his lust becomes between him and God, it stands between him and God. For he has elevated his lust and the object of his lust above God Almighty, making them his God. Therefore, he is, by definition, an idolater. If any man sets the rule of men, his or any others, above the rule of God, he becomes an idolater. These men, not only are they spiritual cowards, but they are idolaters. No, they don't have little figurines of Buddha to which they pray. But they have set up their own rule, their own doctrine, their own beliefs between them and God and say that it's good and it's right and it is the way in which we ought to live. And so they say even in this book. Now, what are the standards which these two fellows, Ashley and Russell, what are their standards? Could it be Campbell and Stone? Yes, it is. But are they in fact standards of anything? No. But to these two fellows, they certainly are. Well, in this book, they make a plea to follow the message of the Restoration Movement, and two of those key players were Alexander Campbell and Barton W. Stone, of course. Now, I want to notice this with you from pages 42 and 43 of this book, and they use this uh, quote to establish their point, and they say, Such an understanding was once the foundation of our movement, going back to the days of Alexander Campbell and Barton Stone, when the movements led by those two great, great leaders merged in, in 1832, it was not because they saw everything alike on all points of Christian doctrine and practice. They disagreed about names, with Campbell's followers preferring disciples and stones using Christians. They differed on the frequency of the Lord's Supper. The disciples practiced weekly communion while the Christians observed communion less often. They differed on views of the Holy Spirit with uh, which Stone taught played a much larger role in conversion than Campbell did. There was even a strong divergence of opinion on the right of baptism. While both groups practiced baptism by immersion, most in Stone's movement did not insist that it was essential for the remission of sins. Well, Campbell's movement did. Despite these differences, though, Campbell and Stone held each other in high esteem, always attributing to the other the best of motives for the views that they held. They shared sincere fellowship with one another along with a passion for God's word and a hatred for division. They did not consider their disagreements unimportant or unworthy for further study and continued dialogue. Now notice this, and we've seen this throughout all of our lectures so far. What they considered more important, however, was the unity of the body of Christ. They recognized that their particular movements did not solely comprise Jesus' camp. Now this next step uh, statement is really, if you want to put this whole book in one phrase, this is it. They were content to be Christians only, but not the only Christians. That's the entire point of this book. And they say we celebrate the revival of such a spirit among our churches today. In fact, we see many similarities between the days when our movement was birthed and today. So we ask this question, which is more important to these two fellows, the movement or the word of God? What is to be restored, the movement or Bible-begotten Christianity, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 15? Well, we know it's their own doctrine that they wish to spread among the world. Despite the many doctrinal tenets, and there are many that are noticed here, which these authors, authors say the movement possessed, it is to be upheld as celebrated spirit among our churches today. The error which they applaud is seen throughout all of these liberal agendas. Unity in the body of Christ to the exclusion of all that's right and good, to the exclusion of doctrine. Now, these men say that those within the movement did not see, quote, everything alike in all points of Christian doctrine and practice. Now, how is it that Ashley and Russell can say that in view of Paul's command for doctrinal purity and unity? Notice this in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. We know this verse. Now, I beseech you, brethren, by the, 
by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Paul also said that their divisions were the product of a carnal or sinful attitudes and actions. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? 1 Corinthians 3, verses 3 and 4. The one that was important in these matters was God and his word. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believe, even as the Lord gave to every man? Now verse 7. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 5 and 7. The Corinthians were not to be united by their own carnal rules, but by the word of God. Is that not exactly what Paul was saying? This same word was the standard for every congregation. And there were no exceptions among the various congregations and definitely no unity in diversity, which these authors are advocating. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me, for this cause have I sent to you Timotheus, who is my beloved son, the faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ. Now notice the last part of the verse. As I teach everywhere in every church, every member of every church was to imitate Christ, uh, to imitate Paul as he followed Christ, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, by following the word which was preached by Paul. That's how they would be imitators of Paul and of Christ, by following that which was preached. Now notice that he said, as I teach everywhere in every church, every congregation had the same rule, the same standard. Therefore, there was no room for variations in the doctrine. These fellows just do not understand that. There is one way to be right and one way only concerning doctrine, and that is that which the word truly does teach. Now, when we want to answer this question, how is it actually, and Russell can say that in view of uh, Paul's command for doctrinal purity and unity, we find that in the second paragraph, which we quoted from the quote we had earlier, they did not consider their disagreements, and again, they're talking about Stone and Campbell, they did not consider their disagreements unimportant or unworthy of continued study and continued dialogue. And what they considered more important, however, was the unity of the body of Christ. Well, that's how, what we see, isn't it? Unity is more important than doctrine. Because unity is more important than doctrine, Stone and Campbell could, quote, share sincere fellowship with one another. Ashley and Russell would have men to pit unity against doctrine, rejecting that fellowship is doctrine. They don't seem to understand that, that there is biblical doctrines concerning fellowship. It is a doctrine of the gospel of Christ. So we say, what contradiction? What hypocrisy? These two authors are showing themselves to be the irrational false teachers that they are. And they are condemning themselves by their own words, but such is ever the case. Matthew 12, verse 37. Now, they go on to laud another restoration uh, personage, and that is T.B. Larimore. And he was mentioned earlier in this lectureship. I want to notice with you something coming from pages 71 and 72 of this book. A man who exemplified the posture and attitude we are recommending was T.B. Larimore. So they're applauding him, setting him up as this great figure of all that the church should be. Let's notice a little bit more about this fellow, what they say that he did and how he reacted. They said that uh, Larimore was a respected evangelist around the turn of the 20th century. At the height of his ministry, Larimore preached several times a day, averaging over 700 sermons per year and baptizing thousands of people. He was respected by both sides of the movement and was often invited by both a cappella and instrumental churches to be their guest evangelist even years after the official 1906 split. Those of us who have studied Brother McGarvey, you remember that he would go and speak to those who used the instrument but you remember his reaction, his conclusion after having done that for a number of years. He said that should not have been done. These fellows are 
not giving due justice to these fellows for one thing, and as Brother Oxendine mentioned yesterday, that they simply take what they want from this history and use it to substantiate themselves. They pick and choose what they want to use. Laramore refused to weigh in on the controversies of the day, calling them untaught questions among us. And quote, I propose never to stand identified with one special wing, branch, or party of the church. He said, my, my aim is to preach the gospel. He was publicly challenged in an open letter to the Christian Standard in, 19, in 1897, rather, to take a stand one way or the other. And he was criticized by both sides as indecisive for refusing to do so. And so he was. But Laramore responded, Neither publicly or never publicly or privately have I expressed opinion or preference, preference relative to any of these matters over which brethren are wrangling and disputing and dividing the church of Christ. Never! I am for Christ, and I believe I can do more for him, his cause, and humility without meddling with these quote-unquote matters. Hence, I let them alone and just simply preach the word, the gospel of Christ, the power of God unto salvation. And I would say, how is it possible for any preacher to preach the pure, unadulterated gospel of Christ without taking a stand against that which is error? Have you never read Jude verse 3? Earnestly contending for the faith. Laramore insisted that there were good people on both sides and that it was wrong to assume that the good was all on one side and the bad on the other. Quote, I am as apt to be wrong as my brother, he said. Neither of us is infallible. I must love my brethren and never refuse to fellowship them. Any of them. Any of them, he says simply because we do not always understand all questions exactly alike. Is there any guessing as to why these fellows just love Brother Laramore? He's one of their own. Well, the Campbells are also used to promote Ashley and Russell for unity and diversity. And they begin to uh, notice that here on pages 39 and 40 where they say Thomas Campbell's famous Declaration and address begins with this salutation. To all that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity throughout all the churches. Campbell then refer refers to them as dearly beloved brethren. At the time there were no independent Christian churches or a cappella churches of Christ. Yet Campbell addressed those in the denominational world as his brothers. His son Alexander Campbell wrote that if there were no Christians in other groups... Now, if they got this quote correct, then absolutely Brother Campbell was in error in saying this. should know that. Where he says, quote, For many centuries there has been no church of Christ, no Christians in the world, and the promises concerning the everlasting kingdom of the Messiah have failed, and the gates of hell or Hades have prevailed against his church. And they say that Campbell concluded by saying this cannot be. And therefore, there are Christians among the sects. Well, that's error. That's error. You have to obey the gospel of Christ in order to be a child of God. End of story. And so it has been for 2,000 years. There is little wonder why Ashley and Russell uphold Laramore's position as they have portrayed it. They praise Laramore for, quote, not weighing in on the controversies of the day. Why? Because they will not do so themselves. They say it would be great if we could divide doctrines into two categories. Now notice this. Doctrines where the Bible speaks and doctrines where the Bible is silent. Oh, really? We could then agree to allow freedom of disagreement in all matters where the Bible is silent. What they're trying to do is to put doctrines of the Bible into the area of expediency where they can use their own judgment. Now we should notice that the word doctrine, and we take this from Thayer's Greek lexicon, root words such as didaskalos and didasko, that they without exception each relate to teaching this word doctrine. And I would ask how can a doctrine be silent? Can there exist teaching that does not teach which is what they're trying to say. And these conclusions are irrational and hopelessly ridiculous. But do they realize that? Obviously not. Wherein God has allowed men to use their own judgment in fulfilling his commands, that's expediency or matters of option, 
That is liberty. But liberty is granted to us by the doctrine of God. There are no silent doctrines. There is no teaching that does not teach. Why then do Ashley and Russell seek to make some of the teaching, teachings or doctrines of Christ silent teachings? Why? So they can, quote, agree to allow freedom of disagreement in all matters where the Bible is silent. So they can agree to disagree. They are seeking to classify some of the doctrines of God as matters of judgment so they can feel free to do as they please. And if any would speak against their actions, they believe that it can, they can reply with self-righteous dismissal. Now, this is exactly what the liberals do when we confront them. And they say, exactly. And they support this and say, this is really what all of you who are spiritual and righteous and following Christ, this is how you should respond to all who say anything against the way that you think, the way that you teach, the things that you do. This is what they say. And it's very simple. They are, we are, that is those who should follow them, should politely thank the critics, critics that would be us, for their input, then continue on. And that's about all we get out of the liberals. Well, we appreciate your comments. Have a good day. And that's about where it goes. They won't answer the questions put to them and I may add right here, you know that there are many in the brotherhood who say that they are sound and do this very same thing. Those who support Dave Miller and a number of other errors. How many times have we put the questions to them to support their doctrines that they hold? Prove it. But they refuse. Though they say they have much to support themselves, but it is yet to to be forthcoming. Well, what's the difference between those just mentioned and these two men? Not much. As John Wayne would say, I'd hate to have to live on the difference. Not much difference. If a man can choose which commandments of God he will obey and which he will disobey, then he is free to do anything he desires and he can call it good. You remember the prophet Isaiah said, Woe unto them! that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Isaiah 5 and verse 20, and that's exactly what these fellows are doing. Being able to pick and choose what is doctrine and what is not is very convenient when one desires to fellowship that which God refuses to fellowship. Notice again this statement from the authors of Together Again. Quote, let's return to Thomas Campbell's simple designation and call those who, quote, love the Lord Jesus in sincerity, our brothers. Now, lest any should miss the deeper meaning behind this first statement, this one is offered. Again, quoting from them. But if a group claims to be in submission to the Lord Jesus and sincerely seeks to follow his word, then let's call them brothers and sisters. That's what they're saying. Ashley and Russell claim that all that is necessary for one to be a faithful Christian is to claim, that's key now, claim to be in submission to God and to be sincere. But in reality, one does not even have to do that much because they also said, let us do so, that is, call them brethren, in the hope and trust that God's grace is sufficient not only to cover a multitude of sins, but a multitude of doctrinal errors as well. Are not those who follow pagan religions full of doctrinal errors? Their own doctrine, which is in opposition to the Bible, according to Ashley and Russell, those sincere claimers do not really have to be in submission to God or really even seeking his word. Well, why not be consistent and just call everyone a brother, including the atheist and idol worshiper? Why not just go ahead and accept everyone in the whole world? They might as well. That's where their doctrine leads them. When one makes his own rules, any man can be fellowshiped and called brother. But this cannot be done except God first be cast from one in his word, trampled underfoot as so much rubbish. And that's exactly what they're doing. The bottom line is that Ashley and Russell claim that the restorationists fellowshiped any and all who presented themselves as sincere followers of Christ. Why these authors really do contradict themselves, as has been shown already in this lecture. 
And therefore, they've destroyed any credibility they may desire. They don't see that. They don't see themselves as the true spiritual cowards that they are and the very foolish men that they are. Men are most blind oftentimes when they look into the mirror. And so these men are. They have, however, made a very fatal mistake. It is the kind of grievous mistake that will, in fact, cost them their souls if they repent not. They have disdained what God has decreed concerning fellowship and by doing so have set up their own standard, which makes their doctrine the doctrine of devils. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. They follow the doctrines of devils. I want us now to notice Ashley and Russell's eisegesis. Perhaps that's a new word to some. I want to notice two words involving this, exegesis and eisegesis. Exegesis is a term used to describe the proper way to draw out the meaning in any verse of scripture. And I cite D.R. Dungan in his book on hermeneutics where he says exegesis means to lead out. It is the application of the principles of hermeneutics in bringing out the meaning of any writing which might otherwise be difficult to understand. And those of us who are preachers of the gospel, we understand that this is absolutely essential in our teaching and our preaching, that we exegete the passages and never eisegesis. Why? Because eisegesis is, in fact, the opposite. Now, this word eisegesis is prefaced by the Greek word eis, which is preposition denoting entrance into or direction and limit. That comes from Thayer's. And Dungan defines uh, eisegesis as interpreting by this method is not exegesis but eisegesis. They do not, notice this now, they do not obtain the meaning of the text but thrust, that's ice, thrust something into it. So how are these fellows practicing eisegesis? They are forcing their own beliefs into the word of God. Now exegesis and eisegesis are indeed opposites. Eisegesis being harmful to the proper understanding of the scriptures. And it can cause one to be lost in a devil's hell. Did they not understand that? Now, this is this idea of eisegesis is exemplified in this book. That's what this is all about. And I'm only going over a little bit of what's found in this book. You know, this book is fairly short, 128 pages, the total thing but I would consider it to be one of the most dangerous books on the face of the planet. Why? Because it's full of doctrinal error from start to finish, but it sounds sweet. It sounds good and prosperous. It's politically correct. Easy for people to swallow. And so, yes, it is a very dangerous book. Now, Ashley and Russell have a methodology to establishing their own doctrine from passages of the Bible. And we need to understand that these two men cannot establish their own biblical doctrines unless they first use eisegesis. They can't come up with a false doctrine unless they thrust something into the word. Their doctrinal tampering examined here, as we're doing this morning, centers around the use of mechanical instruments of music and worship. Now, in the, the lectureship book, we, in that, my chapter, I go into quite a bit of detail, and I want to share some of that with you this morning. Now, the use of the instrument is certainly not Ashley and Russell's only hermeneutical error in this book, but it's the one that we're going to use as a case in point. Now, they try to prove their position by this, and I quote from pages 65 and 66. There are inferences of Scripture that both sides have used to prove their point. Now, they're talking about the instrumentalists and the a cappella groups, as they call them, that both sides have used to prove their point. But both sides, now notice this, the arrogance of this statement, but both sides must admit that no passage, no passage now, no passage in the New Testament clearly prohibits or permits the use of instruments in worship. That is an absolute lie. Absolute lie. We'll notice that as we continue. 
The Bible is clear, however, as to how we are to address such matters. Now, notice this, and they quote from Romans 14. This is, again, from the NIV now, and an incomplete uh, quotation as well. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God, and he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Romans 14, 5 through 11. And again, that is from the NIV, and it is an incomplete quote. They go on by saying, we are not to ignore or belittle such disputable matters. On the contrary, we are to personally wrestle with them to the point that we are, quote, fully convinced in our own minds what is right and wrong. Subjectivism. Let me read that again. On the contrary, this is how you're to determine what's right and wrong. We are to personally, in each individual, wrestle with them to these verses of Scripture to the point that we are, quote, fully convinced in our own minds what is right and wrong. This places it squarely in the point of each person. Determine what you want to do on your own and call it right. But for the sake of unity, we are not to pass judgment on the one who disagrees with us. To his own master, he stands or falls. Both of our fellowships have, at times, had a sectarian spirit regarding the instrument use. And we agree that we should repent of such attitudes and accept this as a disputable matter, but we should not divide it. Ashley and Russell begin by declaring that there is no clear passage in the gospel that prohibits or permits the use of instruments in worship. One must suppose that they have forgotten about Ephesians 5, 19 and Colossians 3, 16 and 17. In fact, they have ignored those two passages and have refused to accept what God's word teaches concerning these matters. They say that all must admit this proclamation they have made concerning the use of instruments in worship. And I say, oh no, Mr. Ashley. Oh no, Mr. Russell. The faithful will not. They have never. And we will never concede that point and compromise on the truth. We're not going to accept that. And we're not going to admit that the Bible does not teach what must be done concerning instrument, the use of the instrument in worship. They consider this simply to be a disputable matter. Why? So they can make their own rules and say that each must personally wrestle with each of these points until they determine what's right. Well, I want to notice with you another passage. These fellows literally use eisegesis. They take the passage and put their own words in it in brackets. Literal eisegesis. And they say, Paul uses the eating of meat that has been sanctified or sacrificed to idols as an example. That debate in the early church over whether or not a person could eat meat that has been sacrificed to idols has many parallels to the debates we have waged in our churches over the use of the instrument. We could substitute, now here's how they do it, we could substitute instrument for food in Romans 14 and gain some helpful insights, so they say. And so they take this passage and put their words into it. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food, now in brackets, or instrument is in, unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat or play, that's in brackets, you are no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating or playing, destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food, now in brackets, or instrument. And they say here that their bracketed words are added by the authors. That's exactly what they've done. That is a literal example of eisegesis. They put their own words, which are not correct with the context, in that passage. And they say that Romans chapter 14 has many parallels to the debates we've waged in our churches over the use of instruments. The fact of the matter is that Romans 14 has absolutely nothing to do with that topic. Nothing. Nothing. You should notice, of course, that from the King James, we begin in Romans 14, Him that is weak in the faith receive you, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let him not that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let him that eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. We should notice that the two men described in this chapter, the one who eats all things and the one who eats only herbs, 
very importantly, both are accepted of God. This is, these are optional matters within the confines of the doctrine of Christ. That's what's being taught. Sometimes referred to as scruples in Romans 14. So whatsoever is not of faith is sin. If you break, go against your own conscience concerning these matters, then it's sin. That's what verse 23 is all about. Now, singing is authorized by the doctrine of Christ and the worship assemblies of the church. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 4 and 5, 12, 15, 19, 23, 26. 33 and 34. And the context of 1 Corinthians 14 reveals that the activities outlined by Paul were things that were to be done when the church comes together. Among those are singing, which is an authorized action for the worship services of the church. And one is not at liberty to discard what God has authorized, but one is at liberty to use his own judgment as to how those authorized actions are obeyed. Some examples of this liberty would be what songs are sung, during what part of the service they are employed, remembering 1 Corinthians 14, 40, and how many songs are sung. Though certain liberties are afforded the church by God as regards their song service, the type of song service is not at liberty. What must be done? It comes to the point that what we have to do is to sing songs, making melody in our heart. Remember that word, solo, the plucking of one's own heart, speaking to one another at the same time in order to teach and admonish. That's what's being taught us by the scripture. And the answer is very simple that how we do that, we sing. We sing. The instrument, very plainly, is unauthorized. Mr. Ashley and Mr. Russell have no case. They have no case. They are undone by God's word. They've invented their own standard and have done so to justify their sinful fellowship practices. Earlier it was said, if it is unscriptural, it must be rejected and discarded as false concerning this book. If it is unscriptural, we'll have to leave it alone. We'll have to reject it and throw it away. Is it? We have proven that it is. They have established their own standard, which is themselves. And Ashley and Russell's practices are indeed unscriptural. And they are false. And therefore, we must reject together again restoring unity in Christ after a century of separation. Thank you, John, for that good review of a bad book. <laughs> you know, uh, those of you who have uh, certainly uh, in the past have studied with denominations, especially Baptists, I'm sure at one time or another have been called a Campbellite, which I deny, certainly, uh, I admire the, the men and the, the work that they did in uh, the restoration principle versus the reform principle, if you will. But uh, uh, to be able to, to take like you may have done and pick and choose the parts you want and then rely on them as your authority seems to me to make them the real Campbellites. Um, and I was thinking about those brackets. Uh, how long will it be before they start expanding that bracket? So uh, instrument, homosexuality, fornication, it just keep going with that. So uh, absolutely an example of eisegesis. Uh, we will stay and dismiss for about uh, the next eight minutes and then come back at uh, 10 o'clock for Brother Jimmy uh, Gribble, who will be uh, reviewing Navigating the Winds of Change by Lynn Anderson. Thank you. You're dismissed.